became a game designer, part one, the games that we had in our home when I was young. When I was when I was at school, uh, most families had board games, of course, and it was it was before video games were really happening. So uh, most families had Mousetrap, Ludo, Snakes and Ladders, uh, Monopoly, um, and Frustration, things like that. You'd find them in most houses. We had some of those games, not all of them, but we also had other games. We had some brilliant games that gave us more choices. In the classic games, you know, the, the, you're rolling a dice and you're moving. They're called roll and move games. You're rolling, you're moving your pawn and you're doing what it says on that space. You have limited choice. But in good games and now modern board games, what we see is that you get a lot more choice. Uh, that games are developed, are designed to give players choice and agency over their own decisions. So, but we had games like that. So we had uh, Railway Rivals, which was created by a geography teacher in Wales, who was trying to create a game that would teach his pupils in a more interesting way. So he had these different maps of different areas in Britain and Spain and all over the place. I mean, we've got maps from all over the world. Um, and the aim of the game was that you're creating your own railway line and then you're going to run trains on it. So there were two phases. Phase one, draw your lines, you know, create your network, your route on the map. Phase two, run trains on it. Now, phase two was quite a lot more about roll and move, although there were some strategic alliances to make at different points. But phase one was very much about where am I going to put my train line? Am I going to go for the cities you know, am I going to go be first to get cities and get lots of points from doing that? Or am I going to be really strategic about the route that I develop across the map and making sure that I can easily get to a lot of places so that I can run as many trains in, in phase two? Now, that kind of level of choice that you get in games like that, that wasn't that normal at that point. But we had that in our house, so I was used to that from quite an early age. I remember making new cards for games. I remember, you know, uh, cr creating our own sets of happy families that had, you know, second cousin twice removed. So you'd have these huge families of like 20 people that you were trying to collect. And they like hundreds and hundreds of cards and games that would go on all afternoon. It was ridiculous. We had a lot of fun creating those games. And that's, you know, that, that's how I got started in game design, just by taking concepts, taking games that were already there and doing something you know, making new sets for them, extending them in a bit of a way, uh, it, it, you know, make, having something else happen on a square where nothing was happening on, just, you know, do something else instead. Um, and we kept those games interesting. You know, those that we did have roll and move games, some of them. Those roll and move games, which are very much roll the dice and do what it says on the square, we kept them interesting because we were creating new things all the time that you would do when you hit those squares. How I became a board game designer Part two, the primary maths game challenge. My mum was a professional tutor at Homerton College in Cambridge. Homerton College is a teacher training college and she specialised in maths. Maths is one of those areas that primary teachers, a lot of primary teachers aren't very comfortable with. It's often their weakest subject. And she knew that teaching children is the same as teaching teachers, that if you can do it through games, they're going to learn a lot better. So one of the things that she did was she had this maths challenge which she would run every year to design your own board game. And all of her, all of her trainee teachers would create their own maths board game and we, her children, would get to test them all. So I remember each year either all of the games would come home, they'd either all come home at once in the boot of the car or they'd come home in dribs and drabs or we would be taken off into college to try them out there. And I think it really mattered to her what we thought, because she knew that the user experience, the end, you know, the, how much you want to play a game is uh, directly related to uh, how much you're going to learn from it. If you are engaged in the game, if you want to play, you're going to play it more and you're going to want to le you'll learn stuff from from doing that. So I was exposed to these games which were in prototype form from people that hadn't really designed before, all sorts of stuff, things on the back of cardboard, you know, cereal boxes, things that were, you know, things that were really quite shoddy, things that were sort of um, 
and then some people have kind of created things out of uh, yogurt pots and stuff so we had all these real kind of homemade prototype games and actually it's not that often that most people see that kind of thing but I was exposed to that at a very young impressionable stage and I was expected to critique these things and say what I liked and what I didn't like and why so it got me into a pretty early on into an analytical frame of mind where I was looking at games and saying what I thought was good and what I thought wasn't good and it also got me to understand you know a game can be a game and a really fun brilliant game even if it's just on the back of a cereal packet the the the, the graphic design and the art they help they help the user experience but actually the crux of the game the game design itself is nothing to do with those you know external factors it's to do with is this is this an interesting thing is it something i want to play and so i got you know exposed to game design quite early on how i became a board game designer part 3 gamification now my dad likes a random number he really likes a random number he's drawn to random numbers in a way that other people will not understand he likes random numbers because there's excitement. You don't quite know what's going to happen. So he creates, uh, for example, he creates uh, spreadsheets that will have all the sort of uh, cleaning chores he needs to do. You know, hoover the downstairs, clean the upstairs toilet, uh, clean the windows, uh, tidy the patio. And He's written this program that has weightings for each of these tasks. He notes down when he last did it on the spreadsheet. And then the spreadsheet calculates uh, what task he should do for the day. So he puts in the date and the spreadsheet goes, ping, today you're cleaning out the garage. And he likes that because he doesn't have the sort of sense of dread of, oh, today I've got to clean out the garage. He just gets told that's what he's doing. He knows that those tasks are never going to be that overdue because the program is created in such a way that it will tell him, you know, that, that they get more and more urgent and more and more heavy weighting uh, the, 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 further on the, the further on it goes. So he created programs for that. He'll also use random numbers to generate where you're going to go for a day. So if you've got half a day, uh, he'll generate a six grid figure grid reference, which is not too far from home. If you've got uh, a full day, it might be a bit further away. He even took my mum on holiday uh, once to Swepstone in Leicestershire because that was what came up when he was generating random numbers using the index of the gazetteer. But I remember, for example, a day when he decided that he was going to generate a random number and we went off to this random number and discovered it was in the middle of RAF Milden Hall. Um, within the perimeter fence and instead of going oh well we've come up to the perimeter fence let's go home now he decided we would walk the perimeter fence so we got as close as possible to this random number I got really cross that day and actually I think I stormed off back to the car and sat on the sat on the the grass near the car until they all got back so you can see this sort of idea of gamification this uh, uh, Kind of fascination with randomness this has contributed to, to, to my early experiences and has possibly got me thinking about games a little bit more how i became a board game designer part four my childhood parties i mean these are the stuff of legends there are still friends that i had from primary school who say, oh, do you remember? Do you remember that astronauts party you had? That one went down in history. My dad used to decorate the entire house. And I'm not talking about decorations like Christmas decorations or, you know, just the odd, uh, I don't know, the odd sort of streamer. I'm not talking about that kind of decoration. We had these themed parties and the whole house would be transformed. We had this uh, pirate party and the, the garden was turned into this sort of desert island. We had this astronauts party and the, the loft, which previously was, was not boarded out, was boarded and carpeted for the party and made into this god's lair and it was the whole house was it create, made into this sort of um, uh, planet 
And so you'd go into a room and it was almost unrecognisable from what room it was before. It used to drive my mother mad because it would take ages. It wouldn't just be, oh, let's set up for the party that morning. It would be days and sometimes weeks of hanging up sheets and hanging up blankets to create grottos. So for the astronauts party, I remember we had a, he'd done something on the stairs, which mum really hated. Uh, he put a ladder up half, of the stairs on the left hand side and and a, a sort of blanket tunnel on the other half and the idea was when you go up the stairs you have to go on the ladder and when you come down the stairs you have to come in the tunnel and but mum was just get mad because she said I'm carrying a tray of cups of tea how can I possibly go up a ladder and this is what she had to deal with I remember that that party the astronauts party he made the tiny utility room into the spaceship and put the, the, uh, the, the washing machine, which was in there, and this sort of dust buster hoover made it into the sound of takeoff. And we had flashing lights, which he'd rigged up, you know, put gels on all the lights to make them look different. That party, people had to come, uh, and the, the parents always looked dubious for these parties because sometimes there were, you know, their children had left in tears. On the pirates party one of the children got stuck under a chair as she was trying to make her way around a grotto to get to this sort of pirate's lair and she got stuck under the chair and we, we didn't find her because we couldn't see anything because it was pitch black through this thing so we didn't realize she was stuck for ages and she got she never came back to another party so you know that that wasn't that wasn't ideal but you know the parents would sort of with trepidation uh drop them off and the, the astronauts party they had to leave them at the garage where the children were ushered in to a training camp to see how much weight they could lift because then they were going to have paving slabs strapped to their back to see how much weight they could carry up to the god in the loft as a gift and you can imagine a parent dropping off at this party where i'm sorry what you're going to make my child carry a paving slab around your house this doesn't sound like a party activity but this is what it was like. So, uh, and, and put everybody in bin bags. The first thing he did at the astronauts party before they even did their training was, right, you're wearing this astronaut suit, it's this bin bag thing with, gold, with silver stuff attached to it. And he'd create these huge, you know, elaborate menus with uh, pork sausages in strawberry jelly. Totally disgusting. Uh, bananas in, uh, in custard. No. Bananas with melted cheese in custard. Not good. Uh, onions and gherkins, pickled onions and gherkins in hot chocolate sauce. You know, and he's like, well, this is the food of the planet. And then he was a headmaster in a, in a secondary school and he used to employ children from his school and get them to come over and be characters in the worlds that he created. So, you know, this is a very creative, exciting party atmosphere that was totally different from the kind of past the parcel culture. And I must say, just an aside, I haven't managed to keep up the tradition. It was it was too much. I've I've totally failed and not managed to throw the kind of parties my dad did. But as a child, it inspired me. It made me think about what you can create out of nothing, out of some blankets. You know, it, it was a totally created world that was full of opportunities and possibilities. Now that's had a big impact on my creativity. How I became a board game designer, part five. A family of teachers. I lived with three adults as I was growing up, my mum, my dad, and my granny, and they were all teachers. Well, my granny was retired by the time I knew her, but previously she was a teacher. Uh, my dad was a head teacher, and both my mum and my dad had been teacher trainers mum for most of her career and there's a certain attitude that goes with teaching there's a certain attitude of learning as well as teaching I mean most good teachers are lifelong learners you're always learning new stuff so uh, they were quite happy to put themselves into situations like playing games where they were learning new skills learning new ideas but more than that, they knew that games were a really good way to teach. That if you can get people playing a game, then they are more, and, and being engaged in that game and being interested in that game, then they are learning without even thinking about learning. 
So my mum would create these games which she would uh, teach her students, uh, student teachers, her trainee teachers, or the pupils in her class. I mean, she's 82 now and she still does supply teaching. She only stopped having her GCSE classes last year. I mean, she's retired so many times, but she keeps going back to teaching maths A-level, to teaching maths GCSE, to teaching Key Stage 3. You know, she's just, you know, just a born teacher. And she always teaches through games. She would try out the games on us when we were young. So, you know, she'd say, oh, I've got a bit of an idea about uh, an activity I might do. Sometimes it was an activity, sometimes it was a game. Um, and she'd try it out on me and my sister first. And we would have to feed back to her on what we thought. And, uh, and she'd really look for our reactions and how engaged we were. And one of the interesting things between me and my sister was that we approached things very differently. My sister is an academic learner. So she will approach tasks very academically and work quite systematically. And I am more interested in the drama of the situation, probably. So, you know, I, I'm quite, I want to talk about things rather than always get on and do things. So games often suited me because I was able to chat about it and, and do things rather than just having to work through a series of problems, which I found difficult. So my mum, who was teaching, was also learning and developing all the time. And she was really interested in the feedback she got from us as her children. So this idea that you can be an adult, but also learning. This idea that you can keep creating new stuff and that, that games are a really good way to learn things. That was very much instilled in me from an early age.